Testing, testing. Well, we've still got some folks coming in, but uh, let's get started. First, thanks so much for coming. This is a real testament to uh, the power of Ann Harbison. So we're, uh, we're all going to get a wonderful presentation tonight, and that's going to be terrific. So for those of you that have come to one of the first two next chapters, thanks for coming back. And for those of you that this is the first next chapter you've been to, let me give you just a little background on what the mission and the objective of Next Chapter is. It's really about helping people transition from one phase of their life to the next, to the next chapter. So for many, the next chapter is uh, ending their work career and retiring. For others, it's loss of a spouse or a loved one. Uh, we're also thinking about people that make an un unplanned job change or a divorce. So a lot of next chapters in our lives, and we're going to try and help provide resources and support for that. So the program is monthly speakers. Uh, this is our third. The first two are Richard Leiter and Alan Hilton. Those are on tape. Those were taped, and they're on our web page if you want to see those. They are very good. Uh, we're also going to have book discussion groups, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, let me get out my notes so I don't forget anything. So the book discussion groups will have Ann uh, Johnson in just a minute. She's going to be leading the first one on uh, the second mountain. And so she'll talk about that. And da uh, Dana Essex, who is not here, will be doing a book discussion group on Ann's book, Never Waste a Crisis. I think you've all been given uh, the handout for the book discussions, giving you the time and the place. They'll be in the library at 6.30 on uh, Thursdays. So look at that, and uh, we're also trying to get resources for our website. So if you have any TED Talks or uh, resources or webinars or anything that you think would be um, meaningful and helpful for the next chapter audience, uh, let us know about that. So that would be great. Uh, so we've got... Uh, we, we also are never going to charge for next chapter, but we will take a free will offering. So on your way out, if you're so inclined, there are uh, two baskets or two plates back there to, uh, to put any money in. And Ann has been gracious enough to uh, offer her book for us for $10, which is quite a significant discount from uh, what you would pay anywhere else. So that's great. So... Uh, her daughter, Anna Mae, and her husband is here somewhere, Steve. They'll be manning the table right outside the door. And uh, so if you want to buy a book, and I think you'll want to after this presentation, they're there and available. We have treats. We have uh, cookies and bread and coffee, decaf and regular, that, are, that you'll see on your way out. And I want to do a big shout out to, to the staff that made this possible. There are a lot of volunteers here tonight greeting and welcoming uh, and uh, manning the, the free will offering. But a lot of the staff here really did uh, yeoman work. Marnie, who's our uh, creative person, just this afternoon, both Ann and I got her something pretty last minute, you know, and she pulled it off and they're beautiful and you've been handed those out. So that's great. We've got the... Uh, staff that's helped set up the tables, the treats, and all of that, and so we want to thank them too. So I'll put in a quick plug too. Tomorrow night right here is uh, Coffee House. We do those every year. They're really good. Tomorrow it's Jason Gray. Same time, same place, right here. So come if you can. You'll enjoy it. Uh, Ann, are you... Here we go. Okay, so Ann is going to tell you a little bit about the book study that she'll be leading. And uh, so here she is. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited. Uh, I ordered Ann's book a while ago, and it still hasn't come. So it must, have been, must be in hot demand. Either that or it was stolen off my front porch. <laughs> Uh, so I'm Ann Johnson, Ann Johnson Stewart, or Ann Stewart, depending on where I am. Uh, I am really excited about this book club. Um, 
David Brooks, who's a well-known columnist, I read everything I can uh, by him. And several years ago, when I was contemplating a run for state senate, somebody recommended this book. And I started to read it, and then I got busy. But it's about how to plan for your next thing. Uh, lots of us are um, either voluntarily or involuntarily looking for something, what's the next thing. Uh, David Brooks is an excellent author, and he talks about, you know, once we've achieved one mountain, uh, how do we figure out what our next thing is? And it's funny because um, I didn't finish the book when somebody initially gave it to me because I ran for Senate and I won. And I, yeah, <laughs> well, I'm not a senator anymore. <laughs> Life changes. And Anne, that's why I bought your book is because we all experience loss. And this is timely for me in that I was involuntarily retired. Uh, my district was redrawn and I lost most of my um, constituents, and so I wasn't able to get the endorsement. And so here I am now, today, with really an enormous amount of opportunity in front of me, and so I picked the book up again. So I saw Jim in December, and I said, oh, I'm reading this great book, and it's just, it's so relevant and so appropriate for my life in that I have been suddenly cast again into a place where I have to figure out what to do. So I will enjoy leading the discussion. I don't have a PhD, but I do teach at the U, so I'm used to facilitating large groups. I've told Jim that we can use my U of M account in order to facilitate the discussion on Zoom, and we're trying to find a co-facilitator for that, and so I want to make sure that anybody who wants to participate can. So watch for those details. We can set up a website or something, and I really think you'll enjoy this book. I did buy it on Audible just to help, but I wanted to have the hard copy too. It's not expensive, and it's available at the library because it's been out for several years. So join me in two weeks. Uh, you have two weeks to get started. I'll probably start publishing um, some thought uh, topics and some discussion questions so that you're prepared, but I really think you'll enjoy it. And I just want to thank Jim for putting this together because there's so many of us who are looking forward to our next chapter or maybe we'll call it our second mountain. So, thank you. Thanks, Ann. Well, as we, had, as we had mentioned at the last presentation, we decided to make January the month of Ann. So we have <laughs> Ann Harbison, we have Ann Johnson, and while Dana Essex is going to be leading the next uh, discussion group, she's giving serious consideration to change her name to Anna, dropping the D. <laughs> so we'll see how that progresses. So let me give you just a little uh, uh, insight on in how the night's going to go. Anna will be speaking here in just a minute, and then we're going to have Q&A after we wander around with the microphones and, uh, and get your questions. Book signing out there, then you've got treats. Uh, so let me, let me uh, introduce Ann. Most of you here, a lot of you here, know, uh, know Ann and know her background. But for those that don't, you know, Ann has an extraordinary resume. Harvard PhD. Uh, la at last time with Alan, we tried to promote him as having a Harvard PhD, but it's only a Yale PhD. So now we have the real, we've got the real thing here tonight. So Ann started her career at Procter & Gamble in marketing. Then she went to Gallup, the polling people. And since then, she's done a lot of consulting with over a dozen Fortune 500 companies, including Best Buy, Cargill, Toyota, Boeing. The list is long and very impressive. So she's very sought after for that. And, Ted, and uh, Ann has done a number of TED Talks and again, she's a very highly sought speaker. Her latest TED Talk that came out on December 30th uh, was selected as one of the very few that the TED people push out internationally. So that's quite an honor for Anne, and I, I think we had a link to that, so hopefully a lot of you have seen that. It's, it's wonderful and uh, very powerful. Anne, how many views has it had? Uh, 30,000 views in two weeks. So that tells you how powerful, you know, Anne's uh, speaking is. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Anne. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so 
anyone who's known me for a hot minute is shocked that I would have had an idea at the last minute that I wanted the staff to kind of help me pull together. Um, but this afternoon, I actually got a call from Lindy Purdy in Puerto Rico, who's a long, long time minister in this church, does pastoral care. 15 years ago, I did a course with her on compassionate care. And she called just to give her love and, and reach out. And as I hung up the phone, I thought, oh, yeah, Lindy and I did that workshop on grief resources. So I, that's the handout that you have that they passed out today. This is my home church. I've been part of this community for about 15 years. Um, if you would call this your home in some way, let me just see a hands. Great. If you're like, oh, I didn't know this was a church, or you, you're here for whatever reason, or professionally know me, okay, so we have a lot of people that maybe have seen my story up close, and this is the home base where I have lived my worst moments, and my moments where I do have things to share about grief and heartache and loss. What's kind of interesting for me and really special about tonight is I have this day job you know, where I'm usually talking about leadership and coaching and corporate change and crisis management. Um, and that's great. That pays the bills. It's been a passion of mine vocationally and in my um, doctoral studies. I really have always cared about organizational transformation, about what meaningful work is, and about how organizational culture, well, let's just say how community shapes what's possible and how we put our talents out in the world. So that's a pretty good gig. I love my work. So I decided about um, January of 2020 that I wanted to take a sabbatical and actually kind of put the brakes on the day job and write about my doctoral research, which was 15 years old at this point. Um, January 2020, my research was on transformational learning after a major failure. And the name of it was Never Waste a Crisis. Six weeks later, I heard the word COVID. Six weeks after that, all the schools started to shut down. Businesses start to shut down. Two months later, George Floyd was murdered. So I was in this midst of telling what I thought was my leadership book, you know, finally getting around to sharing some wisdom and stories. And I thought, boy, how in the world do you talk about pain and loss and surprise and something collapsing and renewal without telling the real story? So this church knows my real story. Seven years ago, about seven and a half years ago, um, we lost our nine-year-old son, Ben, very, very suddenly. His older sister, Hannah Rose, is here. I know there's a lot of fans in the house. We all kind of want to be Hannah Rose when we grow up. Um, Ben had been baptized in this church, and I'll just kind of fast forward to give you a little picture of him that we all know and love. We all have, a lot of us have Christmas ornaments of this, this little boy. I do have to say, though, again, let's just be real. Those of you that knew and loved this child knew that I was dealing with an angel and a devil at home. Um, no joke, is John Estrom in the house? There was a night, and don't think poorly about me. This may level out my intro. Um, there was a Wednesday night where I brought Ben and Hannah Rose to Wednesday night programming. I hate to admit, went to go get a margarita with a girlfriend. Got a call from John Estrom saying, um, I hate to tell you this, but Ben, who was about seven at the time, had spray painted the wall of the church. You probably need to come and, and get him. That, that is not an exaggeration or hyperbole. When we tell stories about our kids, this guy was a rascal. You know, he's the kind of guy, the little boy that is going to grow up and we're all going to work for him someday or I'm going to be driving upstate on a Sunday afternoon, <laughs> you know, visiting him in juvie, you know. This, this is kind of what we're dealing with. And just so you can have some proof that I'm not making this stuff up, we did find out that this beautiful child, wild child, was profoundly dyslexic and ADHD and we were able to have him attend Groves Academy which is an amazing school in St. Louis Park. And because he was a second grader, and most second graders at Groves don't know how to write, they draw pictures. And it was that first week, and a lot of them have attention disorders, so it was all about process and rules. And what are your rules at home? You're respectful to your parents. What are the rules at school? You raise your hand. 
So they were drawing pictures of this. This was Ben's idea. Don't set the school on fire. <laughs> that was maybe his suggestion for what might be a good guideline for fitting it. So again, we're going to keep it real. So January 2020, June 2020, I'm writing a book and I decide I've been doing this heartbreaking therapeutic writing, thinking I have this grief memoir of what it means to lose a son and to parent a survive, surviving child and to rebuild a marriage. You know, this is deep, dark, dark night of the soul kind of processing and writing was such a beautiful way to do that. And I had wonderful guidance saying that you really should write from a place of a scar and not an open wound. You know, write therapeutically to process, to explore. And when you're ready to tell that story in service of others learning, that, that's kind of when you know. And so I was kind of getting there, you know, where this story can help others. And I want to put that out in the world, not just as an um, act of self-expression or catharsis, but to really help and guide others. And at the same time, I was like, gosh, this leadership thing, I need to get this book out there. And so one of the things that I really learned in, this, in the book that came out is that what if we put our whole story in, in the voice that we put out of the world? You know, when you think about with this saying about bring your whole self to work, you know, we're trying to build cultures that are engaging, where we can be creative and real and authentic and professional. Well, the fact is we do bring our whole selves to work. We bring our whole selves to the grocery store, to church, to Sunday night dinner. The issue is, how much psychic energy are we putting in to shielding parts of that whole self to be acceptable, to fit in? And I do think in some ways COVID has been a bit of a blessing in that the fourth wall has been broken, where many of us have gotten to see into the whole lives of each other. I don't know if you remember this, this was 2019, and I can't even remember what channel, CNN or the BBC, there was a broadcaster that was a expert in North Korea conflict or something like that. And very astutely, he's giving an analysis in his home office. And in the middle of this very serious conversation about geopolitical conflict, the door in the back flies open and his little toddler, who's like two, comes out with a diaper half off. And it was just so shocking. It was like, oh my gosh. Um, and then it got even better because I think his wife came in with her pants half down because she had <laughs> apparently had lost control of this child, right? So she's trying to, and the next day, it, it, this crazy incident was on all the news shows. You know, we were all laughing and on the show. And, you know, because that was such an absurd visual to have this astute, composed expert telling his views on the world. Oh, and by the way, he has a messy background. He has a little kid. He has a wife trying to do her best. You know, now we call that a Tuesday, right? You know, Zoom has kind of broken the wall. We get to see each other's. So the reason tonight, one reason tonight is special for me is the love and support of this community helped me not only put a life back together to reconstruct a future I could have never thought was possible, but when I decided to write the book with all my voices, it gave me the fortitude to say yes we are created whole, unique, wondrous, powerful. What if we put our full voices into whatever table and what we sit? Um, I also just want to say, ask if you were somehow part of this journey in any way. You made us a casserole or you have heard a story about Ben or you were my soul sister. Just kind of raise your hand. Um, there, there's so much love. If we just went home tonight or maybe we go to the Muni and have a drink or something tonight, if, if this was all that happened, that I had to, got to say publicly a huge love letter and a huge thanks to you, um, please let that soak in. Um, and especially tonight because two weeks ago my TED Talk came out. And for anybody that's in leadership or public speaking, that's a pretty cool thing. You know, you want to do that as a bucket list in your career. But when I was selected about a year ago, they really pushed me to say, yeah, we know you can talk about leadership, but so can a lot of people. You know, what's your more essential truth? And they pushed and they pushed. And so my TED Talk ended up being very, very raw about grief and about loss. And the title is Why We Need Each Other to Survive and Thrive After Loss. And I was, it came out on New Year's Eve, and I was getting ready for a big, big 
vulnerability hangover. You know, <laughs> this wasn't just my Christmas card list. This was, I don't have 3,000 friends or 30,000 friends, right? There's more people hearing this story. But knowing I had tonight gave me the sense of wholeness and acceptance. So I want to start off with saying thank you for that. There is something as well here seven years since our great tragedy, a field that I knew about even before that, a field that I knew about from organizational psychology, um, from adult development, but this idea that we know post-traumatic stress is so profound on every level, not just mentally and emotionally, but even physiologically. Trauma can change the very way your body operates in, in ways that we're only starting to now comprehend even beyond your generation. There's actually genetic markers of trauma throughout generations. At the same time, there is an emerging field of post-traumatic growth, of what happens to people who go through deeply, deeply painful, even scarring events. And they not only survive, but they somehow emerge with a broader, more expansive sense of life a more maybe humble but tender open-heartedness in the way they interact with others. A greater belief in something beyond themselves, maybe God, maybe something that they would name differently. And this study that are really the seminal studies of post-traumatic growth actually came from prisoners of war from Vietnam. John McCain was one of them. So we had this longitudinal data about people that were going through the worst of the worst captivity, physical loss, and then what happened? And it's not just a matter of white knuckling it and hanging on. We certainly know there's great, great loss, including um, death by suicide, all kinds of trauma that comes out of an experience like that. And there's just remarkable data saying that people that go through very difficult things, when they are connected, when they have a space to recreate meaning, and when they have a chance to be messy, to not have it all together, to be in a place of unknowing, they do have an opportunity to emerge bigger, stronger, deeper, maybe more rugged, maybe more chipped in some places. And that's what I want us to explore tonight. So let me do a little bit of orientation. It's like any good educator, we call this scaffolding. Like, what did you sign up for? What are some of the big ideas where wherever you are in your own life story? You know, you're going to get to hear my life story and some professional perspectives because I have the mic. But there's so much wisdom and perspective and diversity in this room. But let's orient. Um, come as you are. Some of you may be in the most tender spot of recent loss. Some of you may be in a spot of just, I don't know which end is up. I left my career, or I was exited out of a career. Maybe some of you are dealing with betrayal. Maybe some of you are just really sick of your wardrobe. I don't know. I don't want to diminish or elevate. We are not going to do the pain Olympics, okay? Come as you are. When it comes to uncertainty, I don't know what's next, and I need a hand. We are going to clarify terms and assumptions. There's some words that are used when you're in the field of grief and loss that can be off-putting, and it can also be diminishing. Um, you know, there's a phrase like, we're all in the same storm, but we are in different boats. So we're going to balance that. We're not going to say, well, I didn't lose a child, so this doesn't matter. Oh, it really matters. Because you're not living my life, you're living your life. Way before we lost Ben, I had cried a lot of tears over this kid. You know, if, if Ben were right here, if he were a 17-year-old, there was a time when I sat in parables, which is a service and a ministry we have with families with special needs, with children with special needs. It was one of the first, like, couple months of that service. And Ben had just been diagnosed with ADHD and, and um, dyslexia. And I remember sitting there with tears just streaming down my face. And I had such a sense of disorientation because a part of me was like, shame on me. Like, dyslexia is not the worst thing. You know, it was almost a sense of like, why am I here? And then at the same time, pain is pain. You're only as happy as your least happy child. That was one of my early experiences of let's open our hearts. Let's not compare. Let's just connect. We are going to explore some essential questions. We're not going to do Q&A at the end because... I have questions, I don't have answers, but we'll do 
question and response. We'll say, what are the questions that open up the ways we can connect over loss, transition, change, grief? You'll hear me use those terms very interchangeably. And what questions should we walk out with taking even further? Um, I did write this book in a way that is just enough, just in time, very digestible. I call it an airplane book. You can pick it up at one terminal. <laughs> you don't be done with it by the time you arrive. At one point, it was three times as big. I was falling in that trap of many first-time authors where you feel like you have to write every single thing you've ever thought about leadership and change. And, you know, that was, that's a disastrous path. So I did purposefully end up with something that's just enough to generate conversation. And so, one, if you are a person that is in pain and just getting here tonight was kind of a big deal, I want you to know that this isn't an event, that there's ways to connect, gentle ways, structured ways, but um, if the book can be a way to continue in Korean conversation, that would be my great hope. Um, and then I'm also going to suggest not just a to-do list, but a to-be list for like, where do we go from here? Now, in my day job, you know, mostly with corporate groups, um, you know, there's this, no matter what kind of transformational deep work we're talking about, culture and professional identity and authenticity and psychological safety, there's a tendency for the doers to want the to-do list afterwards. Like, how do we put this into an Excel sheet? Um, and you know, that's just not my love language. I'm, I'm not as much the, the to-doer, I'm more the to-beer. But I, I will suggest to you that for those of you that want practical ways of what do I do? What's the next step? Should I be signing up for some discussion group? Should I be going to a counselor? Should I be think, rethinking my career? I do want to give you just a handful of suggestions for doing. But more importantly, I want to give you a handful of invitations for thinking about how you are, just the being in the midst of what is typically uncomfortable emotion, not knowing, confusion, disorientation, and pain, the murky middle. And then finally, just to be connected in our courage and our compassion together. All right, so there's a, <laughs> this is usually in most classes about this far in, I say, are you guys in the right spot? Like, did you sign up for the right class, <laughs> right? Um, this is especially important because um, another little fun fact about our life is Steve, my husband and I, we're in our mid-50s, and Hannah Rose, our daughter here, is 21 now. Um, and, uh, put your seatbelts on, we have a four and five-year-old. So. Again, if the day job falls through, I've got a lot of material for a sitcom or a reality TV show. Um, it, it just goes on and on, just the miraculous, crazy, wackadoodle, beautiful way these two children have now expanded our world. But a couple months ago, <laughs> I, I had, church has always been such a central part of who I am and how I learn and how I connect. And um, one of the deepest, most painful secondary losses after Ben's death was my inability to come into this space. And it just, I struggled with it for years. And those of you that know, know. If you know, you know. And then when I was ready to come back, COVID hit. So now I'm really hungry. I'm hungry for this space. So a couple months ago there, I was feeling pretty beat up in the parenting department. Um, and Danielle was doing something about positive parenting approaches, some kind of class. I'm like, I'm going to be there. I feel pretty good about myself as a parent, but man, I, it's a struggle. You know, I'm too old for this stuff. <laughs> you know, but I, I needed a little encouragement. So I got here late, again, because of those children. You know, I was a little disheveled. I get here late. I'm thinking it's in the colonnade. I show up, and it's Steve teaching. I was like, oh, that's so cool. We have this co-leadership model, men, women. You know, I love it. And so I, I get my journal. I'm always have my different journals and I'm ready to learn and be there. And I may get some of the details wrong on this, Steve, but he's talking about the tribulations of Job and death and destruction and God leaves him and the friends betray him and the cattle die. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I was looking for a pick-me-up. Well, I, I was in some Hebrew Bible study. I, I was completely in the wrong class. Okay, so there, there we have it for positive parenting moments. But where you are and getting oriented, why are these my people right now? Why am I in this room in this conversation really, really matters. So I'm going to ask you a question as you enter into this. Regardless um, or and, whatever change you may be in the middle of now, transition, change, challenge, I want you to think your baseline level 
of your comfort, your excitement with unknowing or uncertainty. Now, like I said, I have never met a change, <laughs> a plan I didn't change. I, I kind of thrive on that. If everything's buttoned up, I'm like, oh, let's, let's come up with a different topic. Um, but I know that's not a lot of people's wiring. So I want you to turn to the person next to you, and I want you to just think about name and claim what is true for you. When I'm uncertain, when I don't know what's next, when, you know, I don't know which end is up, this is what it's like for me. All right? And you'll just have like 30 seconds each. It's quick and easy, but I want you to ground in your own experience of what it's like for you when you're disoriented. Let me um, bring you back in, and when we do some question and response, when we do some back and forth, we will have mics so that everybody can really hear loud and clear the questions and the dialogue. But for now, I just want you to kind of say out loud um, a feeling, a response. What were some of the things that you talked about, the experience of disorientation? Anxiety? Uh-huh. Okay. Now you're feeling anger. <laughs> yeah, you like to talk, that's right. Yeah, off off center, off balance, instability. Making What was that? Making lists. List, yeah, an attempt to create order when disorder has come upon us. Physical symptoms. Physical symptoms. Yes, a shift of environment to seek out that which used to center us. Or our, our anchor has somehow been altered. And so we seek that out from other places. Yeah. I want to speak first to the profound physical orientation of change. And I don't even mean grief. I just mean all kinds of things. Going off to college the night before your wedding. I mean, even the most wonderful changes, nine, nine months of pregnancy, changes that we ask for, we plan for, we've dreamed about, bring a level of physical unsettledness, anxiety, making list, right? Almost everything has been said would be equally true on a physiological level, maybe changes in intensity of the most wonderful changes we willingly enter into and those horrible tragedies that hit us in a way that we never saw coming. When you think about the way we even talk about surprise or change, it brought me to my knees. It made my head spin, a roller coaster of emotions. I feel like I was punched in the gut. I felt dizzy. I mean, even our language speaks to the physiological, physical disorientation when we are faced with change. I mean, think of a child learning to crawl and walk and run. You know, our whole body's in motion. It's not linear. It's us trying to physically adapt as well as mentally, spiritually, emotionally adapt to a new set of circumstances. So the first thing that I encourage, whether I'm coaching an executive who's going into a new role and has anxiety and wondering and self-doubt, or if I'm in a grief group, you know, sharing the most painful, distraught, um, almost imaginable, honoring our physical state of unease, disease, and looking for ways we can create renewed stability for what lies ahead. Here's what's non-negotiable, change, transition <laughs> in life. Um, here's what we know, the murky middle is the place where you've left the safety of shore, either by choice or because you were thrown into the, the deep waters. But you have yet to see the shore you're going to. And so that sense of where do I stand, 
what do I even hang on to while I try to make my way? So my invitation to you, and if you've heard me speak ever before, I always say, name that which is still true. What is still true? Your, your talents, your deepest ties, your faith community, meaningful work, whatever is still good and true and grounding for you before a crisis or major change will save you and continue to nurture you afterwards. I absolutely love Second Mountain. I am such a huge David Brooks fan. And one of the things that he talks about is cultivating deep, deep meaning interpersonally, the intimacy of who you live with, vocationally, the meaning with which you do work and express your talents in the world, community, a broader sense of emotional and relational connections, and some kind of spiritual or philosophical calling. That, that whole book is about whether you're in crisis, whether you're 60 or 70 or 90 or 20, how do you cultivate these deep sources of depth and meaning? It makes your life really great when life is good and it will save your life when life is difficult. So we want things to be A to B. This is the messy middle of kind of life in general. This could be parenting, marriage, your first year of college, your first day work, right? This is kind of welcome to life. So let's clarify some of the assumptions in the, in the language that we use. Um, when, you, when I say transition, again, I just want you to kind of say out loud, yell out, what are some of the transitions we experience in life? Retirement, Retirement. aging, Death. illness, Death. Death. Death, moving, physical moves, that, that's a big, big deal. There's a whole unspoken conversation about that up, you know, moving. What's that? Kids becoming adults. Kids becoming adults. Yeah. Oh, the stuff of life. Um, and again, when we think of, some of them are positive, some of them are negative in terms of the emotions they evoke. That's one thing. Some of them are asked for, some of them are dealt to us. Some of them are very visible. You move, you get older. You walk your daughter down the aisle. Some of them are very internal and private, an identity shift, a crisis of confidence, a spiritual awakening. The internal transitions that we go to, through can be as profound as any external change. The word crisis in and of itself comes from, from the Greek. It actually is the word to change or decide. This is the point where what happens next really matters. There's no going back. Think about a medical crisis, like we're either on the path to demise, maybe death, or renewal. If you're having a crisis of conscience, a crisis of career, what happens next really, really matters. Now, in Steve's Bible study on Wednesday, we were talking about, you know, crisis in ancient Hebrews, you know, when the temple collapsed. And how some crises are actual eruptions. Are they're very dramatic and there's a point where, boy, life will never be the same. The internal infrastructure of our lives or our buildings have actually crashed. There's another kind of crisis, though, that is a crisis caused by erosion, where it's a slow burn. That's maybe you've worked too hard. You've put your relationships or your self-care on the line for too long. So whether it's an erosion or an eruption, a crisis is this point of decision where I'm encouraging you to not feel um, in a passive, responsive way, but to think about what do I do next? And most importantly, who do I do that with and among? And that's a really important part of both my TED Talk and what I offer you tonight, but there's a lot of speeches out there and talk and motivation and coaching about shift your mindset, tell yourself a new story, do journaling, like all this kind of meditative, therapeutic ways to shift the story you're telling yourself and the attitude in which you go out into the world. That is absolutely essential, but it is not adequate. We are social beings. We change in relationship to others, to an environment, to an organization, to a community. And this was the thing that I learned most profoundly during grief. And then in the years following, and particularly getting ready for this TED Talk, I started to look into how people handle grief around the world, how people show healing and acts of mourning and acts of renewal around the world and in different faith traditions. And I learned a couple of things. First of all, we are hardwired for connection. 
just from evolutionary biology, the tears that I cry out of sorrow when my heart is broken has a different chemical makeup than tears I would cry if something was in my eye or if I had a physical injury. There's literally a chemical signal saying, SOS, I need help, I need connection. I learned and read a story about how in the primate world, when a mother loses an infant, an infant dies, and she knows that, because usually when they're living, the infant clings on to the mother. And here in this case, the mother is holding that infant um, for days and even weeks until that mother is willing and ready. She's living through that space of the before and after. And when she's ready, she will lay down um, that dead infant. And during that time, the troop surrounds her and cares for her and nurtures her and feeds her. So she can be in that state of profound disorientation where even the daily minute acts of daily living are too much, too overwhelming. And that troop surrounds her. I had a troop like that. They called themselves with women in the house who swooped in and cared for us in the most profound, meaningful, sustained ways. So this isn't just a we need to be together, we need to share. We are actually wired. Our survival in every civilization from the beginning of humankind, our survival depends on community. The quickest way to demise is isolation. That's why in the wild they will try to separate, you know, one from the herd, and then they're exposed. So it's more difficult during COVID, maybe just during this generation, during times of technology, that scaffolding of being connected is not necessarily hard-baked into our social lives. Alan talked about this at the last um, next chapter, about bowling alone and habits of the heart, how sociolo sociologists have showed for years how we're less connected. So how can we do that in a more purposeful way? So I want you to think about your own kind of span of transition change. Again, I'm using all these words pretty broadly. Um, Tight ropes is what I define as just living between extremes. I, I feel like tight ropes is kind of the baseline of modern life. Um, push to the limit, not a lot of margin, not a lot of breathing room for mistakes or renewal. Um, trapped by what I call the achiever's dilemma, thinking the harder it gets, the longer, faster I'm going to work. And it's just, you know, even if you win the rat race, you're still a rat. <laughs> you know, but it's this being stuck by the to-do list without any kind of acknowledgement or honoring of the to-be list. And then getting on that same track, it's really, really hard, and this is where we see burnout. Um, the other kind of elevated stance here is turmoil, and this again has been the entire world, certainly for the last three years. This is really marked by a tidal wave, so instead of a problem to solve, we almost have to kind of surf these wild, crazy waters. Um, we can't be smarts our way out, we can't just get down to business and answer all the questions. Our intellect, our achiever's drive is beyond what is needed. This was the early days of COVID. It wasn't just applying some crisis management plan or some healthcare research. It was us all having to do a profound adaptation because we didn't even know the edges of the dilemma. There's a sense of boundlessness in when we're in turmoil. Like when does it end? When does it begin? Many people in grief talk about, after a prolonged illness, actually a feeling of relief when their loved one dies, because at least there's clarity there. There's still loss, but some of the not knowing is, is, is relieved. And then, you know, tragedy, these moments that really are the before and after of your world. Um, one that we experience, one that I know many of you have experienced, um, if not in your immediate life, you've been in partnership and community as this challenge of rebuilding and this reckoning with the human condition stirs a need in us. But here's where it all leads to. Tight ropes, turmoil, career stress, personal stress, burnout, a long-term marriage, parenting, a little kid spray painting the church wall. I mean, the whole kit and caboodle. The human experience is a process of adaptation. Linda Purdy taught me this, that grief is adapting to this new reality that is um, the absence of your loved one. So how many of you have heard about the five stages of grief with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross? That's, we hear that so often, it's in, just kind of embedded in our culture. They're not really stages, they certainly aren't linear, 
but they're the, the realities of the range of emotions we feel, like anger and despair and bargaining. Um, her protege, David Kessler, has created a new body of work around what he calls the sixth stage, which is meaning. And how meaning making is not like, oh, putting a bow on it, or now it makes sense, or there's a reason, but it is crafting, what does this mean for me? What does this tell me about my relationships, my values, about what's left in my life? And so that's where I think certainly faith communities can explore with each other. What is the meaning of our faith tradition, of wisdom literature, of scripture, of stories that are in the rows and the pews of this church? Crafting meaning is actually the most powerful way to start to move out of the murky middle. Because you will never have certainty, but you can seek clarity. Real difference in that. You can't have certainty, but you can seek clarity. I even think about scripture this way. Is it more important to be certain that this happened in the Bible on that day in this physical rally? We can debate the certainty of scripture. Or we can lean into the clarity, the light that it shines, and how we might live together and make meaning in that collectively. Do you feel the difference there? In one, there's a spirit of inquiry and possibility and growth, and we don't know the answers, but we're willing to be in conversation. In the other, we set ourselves up for what's the answer? Why did it happen? Why me? Could I have done something different? If only, it's the rabbit hole of real suffering that goes along with pain. Pain is inevitable. Suffering is not necessarily uh, a given. So this is, and I'm going to talk about grief a little bit because it's the extreme example, right? And I hope I've said many times, I hope you've gotten this message that we're talking about it all, but the extreme example of grief can then apply to all the other kinds of losses, small or profound. Um, we tend to think, like, how will this go away? Um, I think most of us, if you've gone through a major change or loss, you know that you don't get over it, you learn to live with it. You don't there's no resolution, but there is a reconciliation. Um, but we do have this image of it becomes smaller. That pain, that loss, the learning, the growth, the meaning making starts to have a smaller real estate in our brain, in our heart, in our soul. Does that, I mean, does that kind of make sense in how we think about all kinds of things? Relationships or career experiences? That over time it starts to recede. Here is the essence of post traumatic growth. Here is what I believe is the essence of spiritual transformation, of redemption, and of community. That what happens is the pain, the experience, the loss, all the particulars of what happened to us is still there in its wholeness. But we have opportunities to expand who we are, to deepen and broaden our ability to experience pain and compassion, joy and sorrow, unknowing and clarity. That is the path that is possible even in the darkest moments of the murky middle. Can I hear an amen? Or is that kind of whatever tradition? This is the fellowship of the nodding heads. I'm seeing some, some lights. Okay, so this is no small thing. This isn't a you know, motivational talk and I did my CrossFit and I'm, you know, sign me up. This is the tough, deep work and you cannot go it alone. This is not about being extroverted or introverted. This isn't about being, I'm a group person. I'm going to go to group therapy. I tell you that, for, I'm as extroverted as they come. I, I do groups for everything. And that first two years, I didn't want to hear anybody's story. You've got to be kidding me. I can't believe this happened to me. I don't want to hear your story. You're not my people. You know, and so it took a lot of the withdrawing, the going inward, um, even some social isolation, but with this tender group inner circle holding me. But ultimately, I have learned that, oh, these are my people. In fact, it was two years later, I was at a a mom's retreat for women who had lost a child at Face Lodge, which is an incredible resource for families that have lost a child. And, you know, I had hesitation. I, there was all the feelings, but it was this beautiful, beautiful place. And that first night, the eight women are telling their story. You know, come as you are. What brought you to this place? And one was a stillbirth. One was a suicide. One was a homicide. 
One was an angry nanny. One was cancer. And I am having an out-of-body experience. Like, who are these people? This isn't the class I signed up for. And then it was my turn. A nine-year-old has an infection that we didn't know about, an asymptomatic, undiagnosed throat infection that closed his airway on a Sunday afternoon when he was supposed to be in a hockey championship tournament. This stuff doesn't make sense. I don't want those to be those pe my people, but they are my people. And you're my people. I don't know all of your stories, but we're all holding something. Hannah Rose was at the end of eighth grade when Ben died. And I remember when she went back to school, we had Steve and Hannah and I who were in just this tight, tight bond. We had a couple rules. One was don't criticize. People are going to come and want to tell you their loss. I think somebody on the first day said, I, my dog died. I know just how you feel. And the mama bear in me wanted to take someone out. You know, no one was, no one was at fault or to blame in Ben's death. But I was going to make a 13-year-old suffer. You know, I was ready. That would have been therapeutic. <laughs> I'm feeling it now, actually. You know, I'm, I want to go find that kid. But, but we stepped back and we said, okay, don't critique. Because at some level, that 13-year-old is saying, I felt pain. I felt lost. Something that gave me comfort is no longer in my life. And in a really fumbly 13-year-old way, which, by the way, hello, adults, You've come up with some doozies yourself, as have I. Um, don't, don't compare, don't critique, and get the heck out of that conversation. So we had this thing about big open heart and really practical self-care. You also don't need to hear about the dead dog. So this kind of you know, really profound lifelines with this actual, what's helpful today? If someone's going through real crisis and pain and loss, don't say, how are you doing? I don't even know where to start. How are you doing today? Maybe this hour, maybe these five minutes. We've got to kind of come down to that point of connection if we want to help the people in pain. So let's just talk about a couple essential questions. I'm going to kind of prompt us into then maybe a more interactive conversation about what are the deep questions that come. And this is, well, okay, great, our worlds can expand, but did I not tell you I'm in great pain and disillusion and I just lost my job and my you know partner's driving me crazy I mean it's just kind of like bad joke I remember I heard all this stuff about how year two of grief is worse I'm like are you kidding me like how does this get worse and so when we're dealing with transition um you know newsflash we're not at our best self you know we're not rested and hydrated and clear-headed so the first premise of how do we make our way in the murky middle is make friends with your worst self. The self of you that didn't shower, that said the wrong thing, that snapped at your spouse, that didn't send the thank you note, that got enraged. Because not only does that self need oxygen and acknowledgement, but guess what? You actually also have to let other people see that self. It's not just enough to kind of rage behind the curtain. If healing is going to happen, not only do you have to kind of own the fullness of your worst days, but you have to invite others in to care for you, mentor you, perhaps bathe you, feed you, that primate tribe surrounding you. You know, you don't have time to wash your hair, girl. Like, you know, you want, you want your people to come in and surround you on your best self, on your, on your worst, worst days. So, what does it require? What is it, what's the invitation? Here's some questions. Um, I want you to be thinking in your current life, how transition is prompting you to expand. So, for some of you, it's maybe, honestly, can't, coming tonight was a big deal. You know, you had to have your wing woman. You're taking a big deep breath. You're in the early days of loss. Maybe for some of you, you're, you know, we've talked about the whole range. But I want you to be thinking about what's your growing edge. The ways in which life is going to have to shift, adapt. There's no going back as we talk about these questions. 
Here's some lessons from loss that I think are, can be applied across the board. First of all, grief is not a pathology. It is the most normal human, not just in humans, but actually in nature, process of adapting to a new circumstance that involves loss. Um, we can grieve our youth. We can grieve um, our heritage. We can grieve all our, our beauty, all kinds of things. And that is a very natural process. The other one is that we're hardwired for connection and survival and growth, both of those. And I've talked about that a bit. Vulnerability leads to intimacy. And I've really learned this in my corporate groups where I'm really clear as a team retreat leader, you know, I don't want to get too woo-woo or kumbaya. You know, I've really got to, you know, bring my grown-up self to work. And um, when we do exercises, though, when we invite people and give them ways to talk about their lived experience, I have never, ever, ever seen a team become more isolated when they are honestly in dialogue with one another. They're always more loving, more generous, more humorous, more gentle, tender. When in a, in a safe environment, they're asked to share their life, even, even in the most professional of settings. Um, and in real pain and, ch and change, your most intimate relationships have to transform. Steve and I have a really different marriage today than we did seven years ago. It's deeper and broader and more complex and more joyous. This is kind of a summary of talking about it requires not only not knowing, which is uncertainty, but unknowing. And this sometimes is the harder part. How do we actually get out of patterns, beliefs? This is some of the deeper work where it's not just a matter of not knowing. It's a matter of I have to unlearn maladaptive ways of coping. Oh, I used to just get busy. Oh, I used to just fill in the blank. I used to exercise more, I used to eat more. Whatever those adaptive um, patterns were in the past for minor shifts in transition may really need overhaul. And then also when you're thinking about especially career or just life development, be clear that a decision is not a destiny. There's no doubt in life transitions and certainly career transitions, you have points of decision. Again, remember, think about what the essence of crisis is. You do take this job versus that job. You do, you know, move to this dorm room versus that dorm room. You make decisions. That's not a destiny. That's one, not even chapter. That's one anecdote in your story. Okay, some kind of summary things to be thinking about. Um, in the midst of transition, we need to gently lower our standards for what we achieve and raise our standards for how we are needing to be. Does that resonate? Is that... I know a lot of people said, you know, for years I said, oh, if I only didn't have to go to work all the time and travel, if I just had time in my house, everything would be neat and clean and labeled. Uh, yeah, fast forward three years, nothing's clean and neat and labeled. You know, it's like, okay, the jig is up. Um, so we actually get disoriented and disorganized when there's instability in our life. That doesn't all, all of a sudden make us, you know, more productive. So just know that, yeah, I'm going to... I'm not going to write that book this year, you know, if you're really in pain. Or I'm not going to um, do the marathon now. What I need to do is be more gentle with myself. What I need to do is open up. What I need to do is be more courageous. So these may seem obvious, but I want you to think about it. And these, I have really, really practical examples in my book. Um, rally your home team, and they're not just the usual suspects. You know, I had to find an adolescent psychologist. I had to find a marriage counselor. I had to find a you know, something, where do I take Ben's toys? Who could use that in a way that was meaningful? I mean, the amount of resources when you have a major change. I mean, think about moving to a new city and you're going, who's the dentist? Where does the trash pickup go? You're, you're having to craft all those players in your outer world. Get on that. <laughs> you know, there, there is something. If, if you have to do something, rally the home team. Um, for me, Liz Hilton, Alan's wife, came over and closed down all my open accounts. I was... I was supposed to fly to Japan, I think, in two weeks and had signed a contract and, she, you know, Liz Hilton got on that phone and got me out of contracts, closed bills and invoices. The thought of me doing that in crisis, she couldn't, do you know what that feels like where you can't wait to help somebody in pain? People are so eager and wanting to, um, to help. So reach out without apology. This is not a time to be uh, shy or modest. 
kind of try to de-escalate the big questions about what to do. The big questions about what this means moving forward are huge. So when it comes to the next step, actually try to bring it in. Just what's today? What's tomorrow? Try to disentangle those big questions from what it means to survive and thrive in any particular moment. Um, John Ross and Sheila just, I, I should get a tattoo of space and grace. They were there from the first moment. They are the ones that drove us. They were the most intimate partners. Um, and the space and grace they created for us to be the most hurt, the most broken the most lonely, the most despairing, has also led to the space of being the most hopeful and joyous and crazy. <laughs> Those two kids came along, remember that part? Um, that the, we were already close, but the relationship, and there's like just a ripple of relationships. It's, I could kind of envelop so many of you in this room. When you create space and grace, um, I don't care what your religious or spiritual reliefs are, there is something holy, holy in healing that happens. I'll end with this about joy and sorrow. Um, <laughs> we did decide, and this is in the TED Talk, um, we decided a couple years later, hey, we're not done. We're still, we love little people. We have enough love. And um, like I said, that's going to be a comedy series, not a deep devotional book. But, um, you know, we did decide we don't have to resolve the loss and pain over Ben to enter in new life with Meg and Zach. And if you see them running around, you kind of know what kind of crazy we're living. But um, Hannah's senior year, this was before Zach and Meg came along, but she said for her senior year she wanted to run in the Disney Princess half marathon or 10K or something. So we are like, oh crap, I gotta run <laughs> or at least walk. You know, like things had not been great for me physically those couple years. I've been eating and drinking and you know, I just was not my best self. Let's just leave it at that. And yet at five in the morning, I had my tiara and my tutu and I'm running, you know, and every, you know, got the snot and the tears and like, oh my gosh, you just can't make this stuff up. And at every mile mark, there'd be a character, you know, Snow White or Cinderella and some crazy fools would get off the track and get the signature. Now, I'm sorry, but even if you're Sheila Ross running marathons, well, who gets off the track to get a, a princess signature? But that's the big deal. So I'm running, running, running. I pass, I pass, I pass, I pass. And then at mile five, when I'm just like, Jesus, please release me. Yeah, I'm ready for the rapture at this point. Just somebody, I got to get out of here. Um, it is a Pixar character that she may recognize joy and sorrow. If you have not seen Inside Out, this Pixar movie, it, it's just mandatory watching. Um, and so again, the, the snot, the tears, everything about my worst self, there was no line. Nobody had stopped to take a picture with joy and sorrow. I have this picture of me. When you go buy a book, if you decide to buy a book, I have a picture out there of this picture. This is my like I don't know, Oprah doing her thing, <laughs> you know, like this is my glory moment. Um, and it is, it was blood, sweat, and tears. And then finally, if you do not and cannot find and can't even imagine hope, borrow it. Just borrow it. Take whatever you can from my story. From st I, I spent a year just reading biographies. I couldn't read fiction because I just felt like it was ridiculous. So for a year I read stories of Abraham Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt and that, that gave me borrowed hope. Um, I think that's what ultimately being part of a faith community is, is that the gospel is about the holy of holy meeting us in our most broken places and showing us how in community we can find wholeness. And I feel like that's what we're called to do together. And I will ask for an amen on that one. <laughs> amen. So I want to hear some of your questions and thoughts, but um, one thing I am going to encourage you to do, it, um, not about book sales, but I made it, instead of 20, I made it 10, because if you're called to kind of continue to think and talk, I want you to buy one. I want you to buy two, so you buy one for a friend whom you want to create space and grace with and from. So that's, that's my invitation. Buy this in pairs. Um, as a way to continue the dialogue. And, and certainly, if you are in deep pain and need help, 
this is the holy place of love and connection. So there's people here that can provide you resources that just aren't a handout. So, All right, let's have somebody. I'm going to have some mics and whatever magic happens now that I can hear your voice a little more loudly and clearly. Okay, is it on? Yes, so I'll wander around. Kathy, would you mind carrying a mic? Okay, I'll get it for you. So we'll come to you, so just raise your hand if you have a question, and we will we'll come, we'll come to you. All right. We'll pass this down for you. In recent years, I've heard several times, and it's a soothing thing, to tell someone to be gentle with themselves. But when I think about how can I be gentle with myself, are there some practical, I mean, <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah. So this comes from actually my world in coaching in the kind of the school, the philosophy I was trained in with executive coaching. And it's the fundamental assumption that we are all creative, resourceful, and whole. So we're not trying to coach a problem, fix a problem, change somebody. We're trying to evoke their, the self in them that's wiser. And so I think that's something that we have to see ourselves as creative, resourceful, and whole, even when we're in pain, you know, even when we failed, even when we're disappointed. And then there's a really practical strategy about naming the voices in your head and deciding which ones need a timeout, which ones need to be fired. And I make up crazy names for them. You know, I actually do this. Like, I have my Cruella. You know, I have my mean girl. You know, that's just like, if, I, if someone was talking to Hannah Rose the way my mean girl internally talks to me, again, I would take them out. You know, my mama bear would come up. And so it sounds kind of simple and silly, but it's actually a profound psychological technique of saying, that's a voice in me that I'm not going to elevate. Steve gave us a great example about fear as part of the ride, but it does not get to touch the wheel. You know, fear's in the back seat, but it does not have voting powers. So it, instead of taking on that, now you're in battle with yourself. Like, I feel so bad, and I feel bad that I feel bad. Yeah, that's its own loop, right? Um, yeah, that's really not a nice voice. That's not helpful. What is the nice voice? Um, and sometimes in pain, people, and I certainly did this, I went numb, and I called it my stoner. I just was like, you know, whether it was alcohol or food or just laying on the couch, you know, I just, I, did, I just was in that space a lot of times. And so I had a moment when I decided, I'm going to fire my stoner and hire my inner masseuse. You know, so like, you know, that part that gives me a gentleness that's life-giving and not numbing. So those are, and I see some of my corporate friends here, they're like, yes, sister, we do that <laughs> in these corporate environments. That is a, a very strengthening practice. Questions? Hello, my friend. How you doing? I want to say you did amazing. The uh, Dr. Harbison. That was uh, amazing. <laughs> well, I'm going to stand up. Uh, I'm training. Uh, you talked earlier about the baseline of things. And I feel like for me, being in survival mode is not a baseline. It's my everyday thing. And I just wanted to ask you, like, advice, like how do I get out of that state of mind or state of being and actually give myself grace and get that borrowed hope and continue to, you know what I mean, move forward without feeling like I'm supposed to be in survival mode and getting used to that. Hmm. Can everybody hear that? Let me just share this. I, I again, coming from like my day job, I'm, I'm really of this frame of mind that we lean in to more and more of who we deeply are. You know, we move from our strengths. We don't try to be well-rounded. You know, I'd rather you be an A plus in an area. What's your sweet spot than try to be a B minus in a lot of things? So in almost every sphere of life and normal growth, I'd say lean into more and more of who you are. There is an exception though in crisis and even positive transition. This is, I, I have a specialty with like leadership transition. So say a new executive coming into a new role. It's actually counterintuitive, but they need to dial down the dominant traits and dial up the, the 
the more quiet ones. And this is why in times of stress and panic and just elevated anxiety or even um, excitement, like the show is about to open, you know, you're about to be on stage. What happens is our default mode gets exaggerated. So the friendly extroverted person all of a sudden is like a maniac, right? So like for my extroverts, and I resemble that remark, right? It's like, just take a deep breath, go inward. It's a little bit counterintuitive. For those that are more contemplative and thoughtful, you know, it's probably time to make sure that you have a buddy, you're not in it alone. So during transitions in definitely different environments, when there's a culture, or an organization, or a new city, you have to kind of go a little bit against the grain to create a sense of stability so you're not at the mercy of your defaults, which typically are sources of strength. But in times of transition, you, it's a time of recalibration. Does that make sense? Yeah. And by the way, we're going to be having dinner later, so we can have part two. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? I really appreciated your comment about just being gentle with yourself, and I'm someone who tends to push themselves pretty hard, and I'd want to know, in your perspective, when you see you can make that transition from being gentle with yourself to beginning to push yourself again, because I don't know, I, I, I'm, I'm afraid that there's sort of a, uh, like a negative cycle where you're gentle with yourself to the point of complacency, and I want to get back to a different side of myself that was more achievement-oriented. Yeah. Yeah, so where do we go from complacency? Like, boy, I've really lowered my standards for the long haul, you know, versus what's helpful, right? Um, and it can become a habit. I mean, I see, you know, prolonged grief is now um, a classified diagnosis, you know, for mental health claims. You know, people, you get into a prolonged state um, of a depressed state, okay? Um, I think I, I've seen this both just in my practice and in my grief work. I'm, I did get certified as a grief educator to kind of broaden my perspective just beyond my own story. And it happens to be whether the crisis was an eruption or an erosion really matters. So an eruption, you know, my son dies, I don't have any choice about my world being shattered. I mean, it, th there's no, you know, the reason there's space and grace is because there's nothing left. Yeah, you know, I just was in rubble, you know, so there's a reality to that. And then I, there was the necessity of, oh, I do have to pay my bills. I have another child that's hurting. Like the necessity of life after an eruption gives you some, some push. Erosion, crises of erosion are much more difficult because they're not evident. You know, think about that a couple years ago, the tower in Florida, you know, that crumbled. It wasn't the Twin Towers. It wasn't a plane hitting it. It was years and years and years of deferred maintenance. And then you have this absolute collapse. And so the disorientation of that, where you think life is good, and then you know, building from that is a different mode. So there's not one right answer to that. But that's when I would say, how are you today? What do you need today? Um, and are you connected with someone else? Because when we're in distortion and pain, we do not see ourselves clearly. Um, and so being in relationship with whoever, um, what, you know, like a, even a boss, a colleague, a friend, to hold up that mirror with love and kindness is really, really important. Hi, could you address your thoughts on, gr on guilt, feelings of guilt? I sure can. So Brene Brown and many, many others talk about the difference between guilt and shame. And guilt, you know, in a technical, if we were just talking about psychology and um, not to get too caught up in semantics, it is a response of regret and remorse of something we've done or a way that we've been in the world. And, you know, half of the Hebrew scriptures are about this, you know, like how do we reconcile the choices we've made, the relationships that have been broken in a way that brings um, mercy or retribution or restoration. Um, when guilt about anything, who we, like what we've done or how we've been, turns into shame, that's a generalization about who we are that is just completely a distortion, unhelpful, and is absolutely paralyzing. So 
one of the things that we know that is a complete mind trap in when we're grieving or really, honestly, any time in life, something goes bad, you get a bad grade, you have a bad date, is when we generalize, like all my dates will be bad. When we catastrophize, I'm completely unlovable. Or when we personalize, like what's wrong with me that this date went so bad? And so that's the basis of cognitive behavioral therapy, like to get away from generalizing, catastrophizing, and personalizing when things go bad. Um, and so that's a good way to kind of keep from shame. Like, okay, I would make a different choice. That was not my best day. Um, and that's where the grace is important. But that's where you need to be in connection and community with, or with others because shame um, is just a horrific feeling and it's a horrific state of being that is just a waste for all of our human spirits. And I struggle with it deeply. The other thing I'll say when it comes to tragedy, you know, there was nobody at fault with Ben. No, there wasn't a medical oversight. There wasn't crime. There wasn't neglect. And I have been in so many painful, painful grief circles where there was crime and neglect, or there was someone to blame. There was a legal trial. And I talk a lot about, oh, pain is pain. We don't want to be in the pain Olympics. But I have been on my knees thinking I cannot, the pain that we experienced, I can't imagine if someone was at fault. I, I would have to stay on my knees to get to a place where I could reconcile that. So that's just another, another journey. Dave Sheldon. I'm coming. We'll just do one or two more. You know, Ann, losing Ben was a major wound that turned into a major scar, but the scars turned into a major beauty mark for you. What is one thing that you grabbed onto a story or a Bible verse that really you clinged on to this whole process. I know you had people here in this wonderful community surrounding you, but what's one thing that really made this turn into a great beauty mark for you? Well, this is going to be the last question because it's such a beauty. But I, I feel like <laughs> this is great. I will say in the moment of the worst nightmare, like in the PICU, um, I had a marker on that board where they you know chart the nurses coming in and going and all the vitals and I just wrote God is with us God is in us and God is for us and I wanted any provider of any faith tradition or any person in our presence just to know that God didn't do this there's God doesn't need another hockey player in heaven like what is happening is our worst nightmare and God is in us with us and for us the other piece, and those that know my story, I've had a really circuitous religious path. I was born in the Bible Belt. I went to a Unitarian church my whole 20s. I ended up going to seminary. I almost converted to Judaism. I mean, that's another TV show right there, right? And then I end up in this beautiful place, um, which at the time, UCC, United Church of Christ, I thought was Unitarians considering Christ. So this is, this is kind of my way back to Jesus, you know. Um, but in crisis, those deep hymns came back to me. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Um, come as you are, come just as I am, without complaint. Just those, those deep hymns of my papa were like in my mind. And for me, I have to say, I understand. I can really understand how people lose their faith. But for me, it was a conviction of faith. Um, all the theology aside, the gospel is about the holy meeting us in our broken places and in community, finding a place of healing and redemption. That's the whole bucket for me. Um, I think we're done. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Thank, thanks so much, Ann. That was very powerful. Gives us lots to think about. And uh, get, get uh, Ann's book and uh, tune into the Bible study. We have to, we, our next uh, speaker is going to be on 26.